back to Political Capital, your intersection of money and politics. Now, Cyril Ramaphosa is seen as a business-friendly president who understands the worlds of business and economics. And he is on a mission to raise $100 billion worth of investments over the next five years. He's already appointed four envoys to go get him the said money. But the lady who is in charge of that project and also gets to guide the president on economic policy is Trudy Makaya. I sit down with her and discuss what Cyril Ramaphosa presidency will bring. We are not curbing the rise in the higher unemployment. That is a big problem for a country with a youth demographic that we have. Do these economic problems present a earth-shattering threat to leadership? Um, not quite, um, because I think part of the issue is that um, if you look, for instance, at the plans that are on the table, right, mm -hmm. um, raising um, investment significantly. If it's done in a very deliberate way that tries to actively pursue investment that addresses some of our challenges, then you'll find that youth unemployment becomes less of an issue. I think it's just a question of going out there and just trying something and doing it. Because we have been stuck in lots of deliberation around economic policy and debate and not even implementing enough of it. And I think now just having a goal to say we're going to significantly ramp up investment. Uh, at the same time, we're going to work out a new social um, contract um, via the job summit. And then let's just do it and see how far it takes us. Because you have to start. Uh -huh. um, we, we can't just lament the youth unemployment, uh, whereas it, it will never be resolved, uh, you know, without... And it's not about having the perfect policy package, but okay. just going out there, identifying a few critical challenges and addressing them directly. Trudy, I'm going to change tact here and uh, let's speak about the current, more your job. You are Cyril Ramaphosa's economic advisor. He's entrusted you pretty much with going to get him $100 billion of investments out there. How do you spend your evenings? <laughs> My <laughs> evenings, catching up on email, <laughs> usually, or actually just meetings. Um, because, you know, we do have a, a, a limited time frame um, towards a summit which should announce some mm -hmm. um, significant deals. Of course, it's a five-year target, mm -hmm. but I think what happens in the next few months will set the tone for how we present ourselves as an investment destination going forward. How big of the summit will this be? Who are you expecting to be part of the summit? What will the landscape look like? So we're still planning. Um, we're still soliciting feedback. Um, our envoys are also helping us think uh, through the issues. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that already we, we are in conversation. Uh, we're going to ramp up our outreach, both to local and international investors. And at the summit, we're hoping that we're going to have a few um, critical um, case studies that we showcase around transformative um, investments in, in the South African economy. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a talk shop or an endless debate about the investment climate. I polled for questions before this interview. So I said to one economist, so what would you ask Trudy? He said to me, I'd like to know how the president spends his last 100 days. If he had to break it up in a pie chart, what did he spend most of his time in? Is it the politics? Is it the economics? Is it, is it government's programs? Is it, is it cleaning up SOEs? And because of that, that will kind of define how much of his time is taken up by the economy and how much of a priority it is. Mm. How much of a priority is it? It's a serious priority. I mean, I think you can't de-link it, some of it, from fixing institutional issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for investment, you do need a functioning legal regime, and it goes all the way to prosecutions, etc. So you have to fix um, institutions like the NPA, even though it looks like a big political issue. It does have an impact on... Yeah, um, it's a blurred. On, ...on kind of just how the economy functions. He certainly, I mean, if you look at his pronouncements and his priorities um, that he's highlighted for himself mm -hmm. and that he's set for all of us, um, the stress is on the economy. But it's also around rebuilding institutions. Mm -hmm. Because, in fact, when business people complain about things that bother them, it's not entirely economic things, you know. It, it's a problem if in, in a particular area um, there's endless community protest 
and trucks are not able to go through. And you bring that up. And when we see the president leave London to come to the Northwest, mm -hmm. you know, we, we think that this is taking up a lot of his time. Yeah, but it's not, you see, because if you think about all those companies in the Northwest which rely on public services, public infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, want a calm um, labor relations environment, you know, um, sorting out the, ins the governance uh, mm -hmm. matters, and you can't do one without the other. SMP came out on Friday. I'm sure you heard a statement. <laughs> what do you make of what they bring up as concerns, South Africa's short-term and long-term concerns? Um, I mean, I suppose with, and with all the rating agencies, it's nothing that we don't know already mm -hmm. uh, in terms of resolving. Um, I think it's also been made uh, clear for quite a while now that we do have to deal with some of the structural issues that we face um, and that that will require deep reform. I suppose the point that I have been trying to make is that Yes, you need deep reform, but you also need clear short-term goals that get you there, um, that then create the environment when you've stabilized institutions, when you've um, mobilized some investment to then say, well, this is the, the foundation uh, for the future of the economy. Let's then think about how we structure our markets. And not that the long-term stuff isn't happening either. I mean, mm. you know um, there's a process to amend uh, the Competition Act, for instance, to make the competition authorities um, a bit more proactive uh, in identifying uh, markets where there are issues. Not necessarily illegal activity, mm -hmm. but just barriers to entry that make it difficult for new entrants You've to been fly. working, you used to work for the Commission. How much scope do you think there is in government to really try and make sure that, you know, sectors are competitive? South Africa has a, has a history of high concentration, in fact. Anything else is the oddity. Yes, um, and some of it is um, explained by the size of the market um, being far from, um, I suppose, f more competitive markets of Western Europe, the US, um, and some of it also just the need to have strong local champions um, in, in certain areas, because you also need that. At the same time, um, there are some barriers where you might think, okay, this is not entirely justified. And so how do you open up, say, agro-processing um, to make a more diverse agricultural um, sector? So the, only, the problem with the current competition regime is that you only intervene where there is a complaint um, or where there's a significant issue. But you might also find that in certain markets, it's actually government policy that's driving the concentration. Mm. It's the licensing, it's mm. the rules of the game. So have a process, a market inquiry that says, let's look at the regulatory environment and other behaviors in this market to determine what could be done um, to, to make it more mm. competitive. And I think that will um, actually indirectly address some of the other issues in terms of exclusion. Tree, you come into a very, very influential job. This is, is a great opportunity for you, and you could bring a lot into, into the position you could leave a mark. What do you want to see at the end of your tenure? What's your vision? So I, th I think the president has clearly outlined uh, the vision. Mm -hmm. A, in terms of a new social contract uh, between different, um, between business, labor, government, civil society, um, around a consensus on growth and development. Um, and and that will be kind of the process towards the job summit, trying to get that new understanding uh, between and trying to rebuild that trust, I think is very important. If we leave anything behind, it should be that we have, uh, you know, a economic actors that can function and, and have sensible conversations, even if they don't agree all the time. I think the 100 billion um, US dollars in investment is an important milestone uh -huh. um, that at the end of five years, uh, you know, it, it would be very important to take that off um, as having achieved that. And once again, I must emphasize it's both local um, and, and our neighbors, uh -huh. and also especially our neighbors in Africa, because often we forget about that we have amazing business people on this continent who could be investing here. Um, so I think, so achieving that target is very important so that when we leave, we can say, 
in terms of the landscape of investment um, in this country, there, there is a measurable change. But South Africa's economic problems are more than just about rents and cents, and some of the legacy problems still filter through. We are now currently discussing the issue of land, and that's more than just a rents and cents issue. We are still talking, even though we just addressed it, the high unemployment in this country, the high inequality. So. What do you, how do you influence policy towards those intangible, mm. you know, um, parts of our economic discussion? I mean, so if you look at the land question, part of it is trying to see it in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. um, so I've often tried to look to bring up examples of places like South Korea, which mm -hmm. had a very dramatic and also a very short period of time, um, unlike us, um, land reform process, which completely rearranged that society but also set it up to have um, an industrial sector. Um, you look at other East Asian economies that have gone uh, through similar processes. Mm -hmm. You look at Scotland now, which is having its land reform um, discussion. Mm -hmm. But the important thing about these other examples is that people continue to try and make an economic case for how you can restructure property relations and still do it in a way that actually empowers people, um, in a way that, for instance, in the South African case, could see the resurgence of a diverse um, agricultural sector, the kind of agricultural sector we were very well, we had uh, and could have um, been deepened uh, before 1913, mm -hmm. where black farmers were the main producers uh, of food for this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was um, very deliberately disrupted. So it's not as if there's this competition that if you empower black people, you have low agricultural output. There have been deficiencies in policy that have created that outcome post-94. But the two are simply not synonymous. Mm -hmm. And we need to take it back um, to that understanding mm -hmm. of, of what a diverse agricultural sector looks like. Same now, we have to deal with also urban urbanization and issues around that. We have to then think about actually making our cities more integrated, more dense, will actually also be good for the economy. So I think we need to bring it back to that.